So I have uh, two axes that need um, the, the edges to be sharpened now that I've ground down the bevels with a file and there's a picture on my feed that shows that. So I use the same block of wood and the same grits of sandpaper that I use for my knives. And uh, this, both of these axes arrived sharp, but they arrived with the wrong kind of um, the wrong uh, kind of edge because they arrived with an edge that came smoothly out to a taper from this face and was slightly convex. Um, and that's actually a little bit dangerous if you're uh, having somebody try axing for the first time. And these are axes I used to teach with because they're much more likely to glance off. So by putting a, a scanty bevel on the edge with a file, um, I was able, it, it just makes them engage the wood much more consistently because there are more angles at which they're going to bite in instead of uh, glance off. Um, so uh, I didn't do a, a huge bevel because, um, uh, well, because this is just sort of what seemed like as much bevel as I could easily get with the file. Um, and my file has two sides. I don't have it here. One side leaves a lot of scratch marks and then I flip it around and it, it really reduces the number of scratch marks. So I make sure I, I use both of those. Um, so now I'm ready for the 400 grit. And I just wrap it around the block again. I'm holding it like this so um, it's nice and tight. And then uh, holding it like this and then I'll flip it around and hold it like this so I can look down the edge and actually see that I'm engaging properly on that edge, that there's no airspace between the edge and the sandpaper. Now, it's tempting because it's such a, a small thing to think, oh, I'll just go back and forth and back and forth really fast. But the problem is that it's such a short length of blade that if you go out, you misjudge it, and you actually go past, and then you come back, you can slice open the side of your thumb or your, your knuckles pretty easily. So um, key is medium amount of pressure, nice and slow and steady. And it really doesn't take long to uh, remove those scratch marks. Again, if you did a good job of filing so that your edge is coming to a true point, that there's no um, secondary bevel or flat section left at the end, then all you're doing here with the sanding is refining the scratch pattern, and that shouldn't take long. Um, you can see I'm holding the block at a bit of an angle, so that as I go, it's, it's running along the length of the entire bit of sandpaper. I'm not just holding it at 90 degrees, but holding it at a bit of an angle, and that helps me use the sandpaper efficiently. Um, and we're getting close. Um, this is definitely a situation where it's you just use up the sandpaper, um, keep shuffling it around. So as I mentioned in my post about these axes, I'm, I'm kind of on, on a hunt. I want to test out all the axes I can find on Amazon that are in the thirty to forty dollar range, and these two are the best of the lot. I also had one that was just a real dud. Hi, Daniel. Um, and I don't even remember the name of it, but it had like a, a, dark, like a, a handle that was stained to look like it was walnut. And the head was like this style of head, but it was all silver, like it had been buffed really well. Um, but it arrived and it was absolute junk. The handle was misaligned with the head. The eye of the head was at an actual angle. Um, the head was way too big for the size of the handle and just way too big in general. Really poorly made. Um, now that was the same price, basically, as this lovely little Dubai that's made in Austria. Now this is a little light for an axe, I will say. Um, I think it's, once I get it sharp, it's gonna, it's gonna perform nicely. I have come to really prefer a heavier axe because I feel like 
when you have a heavy axe, the axe does the work for you. Um, and when you have a light axe, you end up exerting yourself more, ironically, because you are the one needing to sort of provide the force. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, I want to explore these in part because I have people asking me, you know, what, what axe should I buy? Um, and my answer should really be, is really always, you should just get a Grandfrey's Brook large Swedish carving axe with a symmetrical bevel, a bevel on both sides, not a right or left-handed one. Um, and at least in the U.S., Joel Larabelle is a dealer, um, but you can also get them on Amazon, and I'm sure there are other dealers as well. Um, but Joel Lar Larabelle on Instagram down in Tennessee uh, will sell you one. And, you know, back when I was starting spoon carving, it felt like a lot of money to spend two hundred dollars on a tool, uh, in part because I just didn't know whether it would be worth it or not. Um, but now that I know what it's like, I can completely, one hundred percent, recommend that it is definitely worth it. Um, if that's still too much money for you and you just can't stomach uh, investing that amount of money in it, uh, the Carving axe from Robin Wood or Wood Tools, as it is now, um, in England. It's this same style of head, and but it comes nicely sharpened uh, with a handle that won't need to be carved down. This one still needs to have this little lump carved down a little bit, and um, and you can purchase a a leather sheath for it which if you're not just going to leave it in the stump the way I do all the time, um, you should you should have some sort of sheath for your axe. Um, okay, almost done here. Uh, now the thing I prefer about the Grandpa's Brooks over um, the Wood Tools axe is that it has a, a better sideways balance, by which I mean the Grandpa's Brooks has more weight up here, which means that it uh, requires less effort to wiggle it this way. Now that's important because as you're using the axe, sometimes you want to subtly cock it in your hand so that it engages the wood more cleanly. And um, having it do so without really any effort uh, just means that you're less fatigued over time. Um, so that's what I mean, and I'll, I'll do a spoon source video describing that so you guys can see. Um, but it, it's one of those things where unless you're holding it in your hand and can do it and say, oh yeah, um, it can be confusing what I'm talking about. Okay, here's the Prondi. It's a little bit of a larger axe than this Dubai, uh, a little bit heavier. Um, there we go, you can see the difference in size there. Um, and the handle's also a little bit thicker. I find this handle to be really sort of just the right size. I did have to carve it down substantially on the back here, but it did a better job than most of these of having a belly that came forward, which meant that I was able to carve in more and do exactly what I was talking about, get more weight back behind my hand so that there's less, uh, it takes less effort to cock it in your hand. So actually, let me do a little test. Yeah, right now, this, even though it's a, a substantially heavier head, takes less effort to do this than on this much lighter head. Um, and we'll see, once I once I carve this down a little bit, that might change, but um, yeah. Uh, and, and in terms of alignment, this ax came really nicely aligned. Good looking ax. Um, this Dubai is not quite as well aligned. You can see the blade is pointing off in, in that direction. Um, And also up is not quite in line with with up, whereas this prondi is really nicely set up. So those are the things where if you're buying online, you, you really can't know. And and one of the reasons to you know to buy like from someone like Robin is that there's a there's a greater degree of quality control around these details. That being said, if your budget calls for a thirty to forty dollar axe, um, these are good options. I would say the Prondi and the Stubai. Um, 
you will need to take a file to the edge and establish a new bevel. And you're going to need to sharpen them and you're going to need to carve down the backs. So you're going to need a couple clamps to clamp them to a picnic table or a workbench or something or your kitchen table. And you're going to need a file. So consider those costs when you're considering, you know, if you, if you don't already have those things and maybe it's worth just spending the money to buy the axe that's already sharp. Okay, just working my way around using up this sandpaper on both sides here. Can't remember which side I've done already. Alright, now I'm not probably not going to show you guys going down through all the other grits because it's very repetitive. But I might stop once I'm done with this and just carve down the handle on that stew by so that you can see how I do that. It's really, really not much to it. I will say sometimes the, the grain on these handles can be a little skittish. So um, you have to proceed carefully. And, and also it's not the end of the world if you end up with a little bit of tear out. Um, really, in the grand scheme of things, doesn't matter. does matter is making sure that you're establishing that really nice flat bevel. So when you do your file work, you want to, as much as possible, create one single bevel that goes around. You don't want to create, you know, a bevel this way and then another bevel at a slightly different angle. You want to create one bevel that wraps around the entire face. Um, so spend a little extra time with that file, getting it as good as you possibly can. One thing, uh, let me see, you just joined a small recap, please. Are you making a Stubiax more carving friendly? I am making a Stubiax more carving friendly, yeah. And this other one, this Prondi axe as well. Um, so the first thing I had to do was take a file and create a Scandi bevel on, on there. And then I was using sandpaper wrapped around a block to refine that scratch pattern. And then I'm also going to carve down the handle. Now, you want to be really careful to not have your edge touch this head here, which is fine because as you can see, um, when you grip the axe, you want your hand to be back a half an inch to an inch away. So you can start carving here. You don't have to start carving right up here. And that distance just about corresponds with the distance of the back of the, the mora there. So I'm going to just sort of take it easy, because remember, unlike carving a greenwood spoon, this is now you're carving whatever this is, seasoned ash. Um, so you want nice, gentle strokes. Keep this elbow tucked into your side. Um, and I'd say, you know, go back to this point every time and slowly start working your way down. What you, what you want to avoid is getting caught in the grain down in here where it changes. Um, so you want to push this, push this in this way as much as you reasonably can and still have it be comfortable so that um, you get as much weight from the pole back here behind your hand to make it uh, easier to twist. And this is already easier to twist um, or to cock in your hand. So um, So again, avoid getting stuck down in here as much as possible. Concentrate on pushing this portion down. And you can see how the width of that Mora blade is establishing the start of the curve right here, which is just about right. And that also keeps my blade safe. So you never want to be carving in towards the head because all it would take is one glance of your blade edge against that axe head to really mess it up. So you can see how I'm starting to get some tear out down here because the grain is changing a little bit. So 
I want to sort of stay back from that, continue pushing this curve in up top. If I need to let it be connected, I can let it be connected. And I'm keeping my elbow in because I'm working far enough away from myself. I don't want to have my elbow out because if this comes through, I don't want any momentum coming towards me. And then, there we go. That's looking pretty good. Um, so at this point, I want to knock down these sides here to get it to be more similar to that. Okay, now we're really into the grain change here. And once I've got this rounded off, now I'm gonna come in with thumb pushes this way. Why not file it down and get texture as well? Um, I don't know, I think I prefer carving to filing and, uh, and I'll end up with plenty of texture just from the facets from the knife. And, uh, but yeah, if you, have a, if you have a rasp, you can do this with a rasp. I think I just tend to do everything with a knife because I have them and I have the skill and um, I would feel like I would need to come back with a knife anyways. After rasp, excuse me, I need to sneeze. <coughs> All right, my first international sneeze. Okay, so now I'm just going in with thumb pushes here. You do not want to be going like this. You want to be using a thumb push so that there's a natural stop to your blade. You don't want any momentum heading towards the head there. It's a bit of a different topic. Have I ever carved cookses in the past? I've never carved cookses. Um, no, never. It's never been my thing. Um, yeah, I would say you know, uh, Alex Yerkes is uh, known for his cookses. Dawson Moore has started carving cookses. Eric Doherty down in New Jersey carves cookses. Uh, who else? There's a bunch of people over in Russia and Scandinavia who carve pretty amazing cookses. Um, it's never been my thing to make them. What was your question about them? I mean, I, in theory, I know some stuff about carving cookses. I could perhaps answer your question, but I, it would be coming from a place of theoretical knowledge, not actually hands-on experience, to be clear. But I am a captive audience right now. So now, um, now I'm just uh, refining this bump here so that I don't have a, a bump because this lands right where my um, palm is, but this is already much more comfortable. So I'm just using that bump there and then I'll be done. Probably not gonna bother oiling the handle or anything like that. Um, I'll just let this weather for a while and then if I feel like scraping it down and um, treating it with something, I'll, I'll take a piece of broken glass to it and remove this varnish. But for now, I don't feel the need to do that. I've got a busy day and um, the most important thing is that it functions well and is safe for people to use in the class. So, just about like that. Uh, and there you have it. Let's see. I can take just a tiny bit more down. Any more questions before I go, guys? As always, I'll, um, I'll toss this up on my YouTube channel where all of these videos go. And uh, thanks so much for watching. Oh, let's see, you have a question. You're just struggling to achieve a smooth knife finish in the bottoms of your cooksa bowls. Um, yeah, I would say you two things. Number one is um, uh, it sounds like you're having trouble having the blade exit from the cut. Is that is that accurate? If so, you need a knife that is uh, a little less aggressive and a little more interested in pulling out of the cut. Uh, so this is, for example, what uh, Matt White, Temple Mountain Woodcraft, has been doing with his uh, pull it out with his scoop hook. Where is it? Here we go. 
um, which has a shape that allows you to really get down into things, although I'm, I'm not sure how well this would work in the bottom of Cooksis. Um, it probably would, but it's uh, something about the edge means that it you really, uh, you have to sort of cock it to get it to engage, but then it really, it, it wants to come out of the cut quite easily. And so I find on deeper bowls, this allows me to get a really clean finish on deeper bowls in a way that the Monadnock, which has a more aggressive grind, is happy to, it will dive in really fast and then uh, I have to work to pull it out more. Um, it'll still come out, but uh, the, the grind on the actual, the actual geometry of the edge of your hook knife is probably what's making it difficult for you to get a clean cut. That and also just making sure that your knife is as sharp as possible. Um, so for making sure your knife is as sharp as possible, you gotta make sure you don't have a secondary bevel. You gotta make sure that um, you have uh, really secondary bevel on hook knives is the main thing. So you gotta make sure you've pushed it down to a true triangular, triangular point um, and then bring it through the grits. And then if you're still having trouble, um, try stropping. Um, because that extra little bit might make it so that it can exit cleanly out of the cut. It might also be that your uh, blank needs to dry a little bit longer. Um, if you have further questions than that, you're welcome to send me a DM about it. Um, so there we go. Nice little refinement to Stubai Axe. Thanks, guys.